So in this video I'm going to take a look at one of those cheap Chinese uh, location tracking and hidden listening devices and you can see the device here it comes in this little yellow box and it's actually a USB data and charging cable and as you can see when you open the box and unpack the device you can later um, repack the device without leaving any noticeable uh, marks at the packaging that it has been opened before. This can indicate a little bit about the use case for such a device. Taking a look at the manual, the device is supposed to have three functions. If you text it DW, it will query the location and send you back the location via text. If you send four times one, it will call you back if it detects sound. And if you text it the four times zero, it will deactivate the callback. Next, we'll take a closer look at the device. If you remove the plastic cap, the SIM card slot is revealed. It's inside the cable here. You also see the telephone chip on the other side. We'll now take a closer look at the telephone chip and we can see it's an um, MT6261 MA chip. It's a MediaTek chip. It's used in a lot of cheap Chinese um, smartwatches. Now after you put a SIM card in you can put the uh, plastic hood back on and it looks like a normal cheap Chinese USB cable. Next I did a audio test. I hooked up my telephone to my pocket recorder and now I first do a test call so you can get the audio quality. The number you have dialed is temporarily unavailable. That was the audio quality yet that you can expect from this kind of recording and now I'm calling the device. And the device will pick up after 10 seconds calling. And you can see it also starts to draw lots more power once it's called. As you can hear, the audio quality isn't the best. There's a lot of um, radio frequency interference and other noise, but you hopefully could hear me saying test. Now for reference, the audio from the um, camera in the room. Test. Test. As you can hear, it's much more clear and you also test. can hear the room better. Then another test I did was radio frequency interference and other electrical noise because once I hooked up the device I noticed really high pitched whistling sound like electrical noise that you can hear on the right audio channel. And here in this recording you also hear on the left audio channel radio frequency interference that you hear with every ordinary cell phone. So yeah, if you have a USB cable that makes a noise like a cheap charger, then you probably should have a closer look at it. Then after that, I used the device a little bit. I sent the DW command, it replied back with the location. I sent the one command, and it called me back, I deactivated it again. And what I noticed then is if I sent the DW command, it sent me back the street address and a link, a short link to Google Maps. And I wondered how did it get this information, the street address? Cause it cannot have all location information all in the device. So that's when I decided to break out my open BTS setup. And you see me here starting it up.
and we should now in the top half see the base station coming up in the radio frequency spectrum once after the firmware has been uploaded to the radio now you see my base station is working and I now go ahead and connect some phones to it you will see in the Wireshark dump that is passing by we will see the connection process there you see it one phone is already connected and next I had to hook up the device you see it here on the top now I power it up we should now shortly see it connecting to my base station it may actually take a little bit yeah there it is and now the device is camped to my base station as is the Nokia phone below and what I'm doing now is I write an SMS to the device to query the location and hopefully see the GPRS connection on my OpenBTS setup. I assigned the number 7 times 1 to the device. So I'm now sending the message. You can also see in the Wireshark dump how the message was sent. You could also hear it in the radio frequency um, interference. Now I look in the sent reports and I delete the reports of messages sent. And actually, now I'm getting a little bit impatient because. I'm waiting for the reply of the device, so I start looking around in the log files and try to see if something broke, but it doesn't seem like something um, broke and everything works normally. So I'm a little bit, bit puzzled. And then I query the Timsy table to see if the if the device is still camped to my base station and there is the SMS reply from the device. You could also see see it in the Wireshark dump. And now looking at the message, it unfortunately has a different format than the other messages I was getting via my normal mobile provider and that's because the device wouldn't connect to my GPRS. So after that I broke out the soldering gear to figure out where it was uh, sending the data to so I broke up the device. I first took off the metal shield of the USB connector then the plastic hood. I used a guitar pick to tear the plastic apart. And you can notice that I already soldered some stuff to the device. I also um, desoldered the cable before. And next, I desoldered the antenna. And then I took a closer look at the device. Here you can see again the MediaTek MT6261MA chip and the RDA 6626E. I then take a closer look at the available pads on the device. And you can see there are a ground, DP, DM and voltage pin which indicates this is USB and there is also a TX and RX pad which indicate UART. The DPDM pads seem to be connected to the MT6261 chip. Also there are two other pads that I don't know what they are. 
then on the back side you have the USB connector here, then the SIM card slot in the middle, then you have the microphone, the antenna, and the connections for the micro USB cable on the other side. Now what I do is I take multimeter measurements to see where all the connections run and I figure out that the USB is just connected as a pass-through. That means the data lines and the power lines just pass through the device. And the USB connector is not actually connected to the chip. And here you see me connecting the UART cables and then I hooked up the UART to a TR Tampa board. You can use any serial interface, serial to USB interface. And then I hooked it up to the computer, hooked up the device to power, powered it up and the computer gave me this this is basically the boot banner of the device. It says that it's an MTK bootloader and it gives some information. However, I could not um, send any commands to the device. So the UART was a dead end for me at that point. I then unhooked the device and got an old USB cable. If you don't have one, you can make your own by cutting one up or you can actually take the USB cable of the device itself and what I did then is I soldered the USB to the previously discovered USB pad and then I hooked up the device to the computer and LSUSB will now give me an endpoint and says it's the MediaTek phone and this endpoint will come and go because this is the MediaTek bootloader and once it's connected to USB it will just keep the device in a boot loop. You could use this USB endpoint to upload new firmware with the MTK and firmware flashing tools. However, after a little bit of research I found the open source project Fernly. It's an operating system by Bunny and Sean Cross that uh, targets the MT6260 chip but it also has been ported to the MT6261 that we are using. And I'm using this in conjunction with a flash ROM to dump the flash. I then used the um, Fernly USB loader command to um, upload um, the Fernly firmware to the device and it uploads a um, stage one firmware and then another firmware binary image and with the dash w command I can instruct it to wait because the MTK endpoint USB endpoint uh, disappears and comes back again because of the reboot loop. So now that it's connected and the Fernly firmware is now running on the device I use flash ROM with the Fernvale SPI flashing device and I first use it to get the chip ID that is on the device and we can see the chip ID here. I just copy paste that and now I instruct it to read it and I read it in the flash.dat file and now it's dumping the flash and this actually takes a while so I will skip this part in the video. Now that we're back, here is the dumped firmware. And now I'm gonna look through it via hex dump. And the first thing we notice is the FS boot and lots of MTK strings that indicates that it is MTK firmware. Here we see the boot banner that we previously saw on the UART and searching further for MTK reveals more strings. But searching for other things, more interesting things, I decided to see 
where the commands that we can send to the device are stored. So now searching the dump for the DW command and looking through whether something looks like there are more commands. So as you can see, we here find an area where there is what appears to be commands separated by some other data. And you can see there's the DW, then there's other commands such as restore, uh, HHH, MC, time zone, time. As you can see there is also the four times one and four times zero command. So that is where I thought that these are um, commands that can be sent to the device. I later verified it by playing around with these commands. And down here, there are commands that indicate that this firmware was lifted off a different device because it indicates that there is a TF card in the device. And last but not least, there is this interesting command that lets you query the um, version and build number of the firmware via SMS to the device. Next, I search for seven times three. That was the telephone that I uh, remote controlled the device in my own um, base station. And the number is also there. And above it, I find here the gpsui.net. This is um, from where I get the sent the link. And further above that, when we look, we can actually see it has my previous number that I previously interacted with the device as a remote control from my provider. And above that, there's also the login credentials to the gpsui.net website, which by the way, is never ever even mentioned in the manual. So yeah, the device sends data to gpsui.net and the user is never ever informed about this. That's my whole problem with the device. Then last, I wanted obviously to know whether I could detect the device. And here I'm using a cheap Chinese RF detector. And as you can see, it detects the device no problem. Um, however, using the device with the same sensitivity on a proper mobile phone, which has better shielding than the cheap Chinese device, reveals that you'd have to turn up the sensitivity of the RF detector to the point where it basically detects everything. So I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned something and goodbye. Zum Beenden legen Sie einfach auf.